The River Wye in Herefordshire is known to be the best river fishing in the country. We've got two of the best river anglers to show you exactly how they go about plundering the big shoals of barbel and chub that reside here. This is a man's river that's going to demand really strong, powerful gear with a really attacking approach. Our boys are going to show us exactly how they go about doing it as they've won more money on flowing water than just about anyone in the country. Mr. Harrell. Good morning, Hello, sir. Nice. How are you? Oh, yeah, you good? Yeah, I'm great, thanks. Uh, you weren't joking, were you? You really are going to fish a float with pellets? I told you, didn't I? I mean, can you see any maggots in there? No, no, you're right. There's not I? one in sight, is this? All we've got is pellets and pellets. And pellets and pellets. And more pellets. <laughs> Brilliant. Let's go on with it, shall we? I've got a challenge now. Yeah, I? you're on. <laughs> Traditional float fishing on rivers is normally maggots, casters, hemp as loose feed. You've come today with a couple of bags of the, the Bait Tech carp pellets. How on earth, what on earth is going on? When I was out fishing on the Wye, I was, I was getting absolutely mullered with little tiny fish. And it was apparent to me that I needed to get a different particle bait because they're still chubbing the swim, it's just the case that they couldn't get at it. It was either the case of looking at a bigger hook bait, um, but then I thought, well, why not completely change things and start fishing with bigger baits altogether? Mm. Pellets for barbel and things like that are nothing new, really. All the specialist guys have been using them for a long time. Initially, I was going down the route to try the same pellets that we used in the feeder. Right, okay. Halibut pellets, right. The actual bait was too heavy mm -hmm. for float fishing because what was happening is that halibut's a very dense bait, as you know, and I mean, I, I always use it for barbel fishing now. Yeah. But as I was trying to float fish with it, as it hit the water, it was just sinking straight to the bottom, and obviously yeah. my float's going off further on, so mm -hmm. I needed a lighter bait. So what I did is just eventually settled on, on a combination of 6mm and 8mm carp pellets in exactly the same way as you would do on, uh, on commercial. The difference is, you see, when you, when you throw this bait into the current, the bait carries a long way down the stream. Because they're less dense than the halibut pellets, they, they fall, yeah. fall a lot slower, don't and they? That, and that's really important. With maggots, it's not unusual to fish 30 or 40 yards of a river, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. It was a case really of thinking about where you put your bait. A lot of people I think make the mistake of just feeding in one area. Mm. And once that bait's ended up in the bottom, that's it, you know. So I'd always use a catapult and actually feed down the swim as well. Initially I was a bit worried that I might overfeed the swim too soon. Everywhere I go on these sort of swims now I'm taking a bag of sixes and a bag of eights. The answer to how much do I feed is really down to sort of fish response. You need to work it out on the day. This is almost a revolution in river fishing. Yeah, there, it is. It's a massive revolution, and what's coming from it is that I've been doing some features recently, you know, things like Angling Times, and people from all over the country are sending me emails about, you know, I've, I've tried this on my little river, I'm normally pestered with minnows and this, yeah. that, and the other, and they're catching chub with it. I mean, on small waters, you don't need a lot of bait to catch a good yeah. bag of fish, really. Talk to me about floats then, Dave. We've got some here that you've obviously designed yourself, and. We're going to be using the, using the Waggler ranges today, don't we? Because I know we're fishing a little bit further out. Um, obviously, if you're fishing a little bit closer in, you've got that model. Yeah, I always try to keep my, my float fishing as simple as possible. Right. I mean, I carry a lot of different patterns of floats for different situations. For fishing close in water, uh, if I've got any depth at all, I would use this Avon shape. You know, you've got a nice shoulder there to hold back against. I mean, six gram was the biggest one I used to make, but as a direct result of this bait, I've actually used, I've yeah, actually got some 8 gram and 10 gram, which just to really be able to fish the bait in very deep water and, and, and to see, see the float a long way down. All of these floats have got very visible tops. When yeah. you're fishing a big bait, now you can always put more shot on and dot it down, but if you can't see it, mm. you need to leave some float out. And I think that's one of the problems with a lot of floats these days, that the tips aren't big enough. And these were like the, the forerunner of the pellet waggler, if you like. I mean, these are called speci wagglers. So I've set up a rig to fish the first part of the swim deep. Mm -hmm. And then I've got another rig to fish the second part of the swim shallow. What about main lines? Because obviously we're fishing for big, big chub, fish. Yeah, you know. it's 0.22 mil, which is six pound breaking strain. You need something that's robust. Right. Locked off with swan shots down the line. All I've literally got on that rig is just two number fours. On the hook itself, to actually mount the bait, you'll notice that I've got this little band. I just use a section of um, eight millimeter float rubber. Right, and you've just literally put the hook through it. So I just crimp it together, and I've just hooked it through like you would almost like with a maggot. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, yeah. You can see how, how firm that is. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So the thing is then, when I want to come and put a pellet on, I just slip that into oh. the band. Made for it. And away you go. Yeah, that's ideal, isn't it? 
And you could argue, well, it's a different colour to the pellet, but when a bait's flying through the speed of the current here, I don't think fish they, have got time no, to they, say, they snatch it there's an 8mm float rubber on there, yeah. and I'm going to take it. You know? and the lovely thing about these pellets is that they, they expand quite quickly. The minute they hit the water, it's tight in the rubber. I could get several casts out of that before it's time to put another one on. I've got a powerful rod, 14-foot rod, simple open face reel, loaded right to the top, you know, so it's easy for casting. What about your other setup? It's an identical. It's exactly the same. I always recommend that people match tackle. I think it's absolutely vital that when you pick up different float rods, that they're all, they all match. You showed us that you've got a bulk around the main float. Yeah, it's exactly the same on the, on the deeper rig. And I lock off not just with one or two sh shots. I mean, you can actually get these big, yeah. these big shots now, but by putting several, just, it, it just helps to stop it slip. Yeah. It's, it's you it don't, have to, you don't have to put one on super hard, do you? Yeah. You can put on. Whereas on that rig, I've got it set about four foot deep with two number fours down. Yeah. I've got this one set at about eight foot with four number fours. There's the hook. There's the shot. What have I got? 18 inches to two foot, I suppose. Yeah. The bait, by its very nature, I mean, it, it's heavier than maggots, so the bait is going to take take everything to the bottom. Mm. But what I wanted to do is create a continue, continuous stream of feed going down the river. Yep. And all the time the float goes down the swim, the float will be covering the feed. This is something I've never seen done before. Float fishing with pellets on rivers. Let's hope it works now. Yeah. <laughs> Before we start fishing, I always try and get a bit of bait into the swim to get the fish confident. I can't see any point in just casting him just with it with the bait and have no feed out there. No, so, no, no. You know, and also it can spook the fish. If, if you're in a swim where there's only a few fish there, you want to get them feeding regularly. So the other nice thing about this bait, Andy, is that you can get more distance. I mean, you can see there's like a facing wind coming into yeah. us today. Mm. Now, if this was maggots and casters, you'd never get them out, would you? Well, you know, I mean, look at that. I'm getting I'm getting two thirds across a very wide bit of river. The six mils have probably got about ten pellets. Yeah. Yeah. The eight mils, four or five, maybe three. Mm -hmm. you know, but the beauty of it is, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm actually firing bait all around the swim. You can imagine that just drifting down, yeah, and each yeah, in the area, yeah. and lovely pale colours, so they're very visible. But I'll probably spend, you know, five or ten minutes just putting a bit of bait in, you know, in a normal session, just to get fish confident. I don't want everything tight. Right, what I want is a shoal of fish. I mean, hopefully, if there's a lot of fish in front of us, I'd like the fish you know, all over the place. I've got the deep rig on. When we cast in that pellet, it's important to have enough weight around the float, in this instance, yeah. with a waggler rig. Important when we cast out, the two don't come together. Yeah. You know, we need to sort of get the cast, and then what Fe I always Feather do it down so it... Always it, check it, it yeah. Lays, it lays out. Right, you just notice, just towards the end of the cast, I just check the line. You want to be able to see that pellet landing. You know, actually splashing on the water, and you know it's not tangled there. Yeah. Because we've got quite a, yeah, it's quite a heavy weight we're casting at the extreme end of the rig. Hello, there's a fish. Oh. You've not had a fish. Hang on a minute, Dave. What's? Told you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's never a chub. It feels like it, Andy. It's a big fish here, you know. I mean, well, they, they do say, don't they, on the River Wye, that they're born at four pounds. <laughs> there's a lot of big fish. I mean, my, my biggest chub at this river is six pound four, but one of my uh, that's huge. One of my customers last year had one 614. See what I mean about going for snags? As well? That is absolutely glorious. What a way to catch them. You see, you've got to have strong gear on. You probably oh. noticed with that fish like running down the inside, he was looking for snags all the time. <laughs> There's the chub you wanted, mate. Good God, look at that. It's perfect, isn't it? Look at, look at the pellet band stuck in his mouth. That is absolutely stunning. It's almost like he's never been caught before, isn't it, that one? Oh, it, looks, it just looks brand new, doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely stunning. Shall we catch some more? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can. That's un unreal, isn't it? What I want you to do is quickly show me your, your ground bait mix, because it really is quite simple, isn't it? Yeah, a pure mix of halibut marine method mix. Uh, nothing else? Nope. 
don't mix anything else with it. This is designed as a method mix, um, so it mixes very well. Ideal for big rivers when you want a mix that's going to stay on the bottom, but also give off attractants as well. And then we'll add some particles in. We'll add some four mil pellets right, okay. and some super seed hemp so that there's a better feed going on the bottom, but we're also getting the attractant, the explosion from the grain bait as it, as it hits the bottom and fizzes out. So these are two kilo bags, so they're really handy. I don't have to take, bring multiple bags, usually one bag's more than ample. We tip it into the bucket. You can smell it instantly, yeah. can't you? you know? It's also got a, almost like a dampness to it, which is the oils. You see it sticking to my hand already. Yeah. So it's really giving off lots of flavor. But the main thing is the particles and the crushed bits and pieces in there, they're not too big. I'm in control of what's going in there by putting pellets and seeds. Uh, into that. We've got away now, haven't we, from the old style coarse ground baits that we used to use years ago. Because of the fine particles, it's going to break down really quickly, even in a stiff consistency. We understand a lot more about ground baits these days. Ten years ago, we wouldn't have used ground bait for barbel, mm. but we understand what it can deliver into the river and, and what an advantage it can be to the conventional just feeding particles. All I need is a one pint container of water. No need for adding bits and pieces like we do with other ground baits, just simply pour a pint in. I'm going to do this with a whisk, which is easy, but you could do it by hand, it doesn't make a difference. Just giving it a whisk around. Well, you can see there's no need to riddle that, is there? No, it's... straight away, it's a fine mix. It's already got its, you know, it's forming, it's, yeah. it's, it's sticky already, uh, but you can feel it's still got a certain dryness to yeah. it. Leave that for five minutes, that's all it'll take. Right. And then it's a simple case, after five minutes, you take another pint of water. In goes the second pint. See now. Oh yeah, it's a completely different texture now, isn't it? Yeah, you can see now I can do anything with that. I can put that into a cage feeder, I can mix it into a ball. But the main thing is now is I'm going to add particles to it. I'm going to put four mil pellets in there, which are quite a big particle, and the hemp seed is big as well. And it needs to be able to take that without breaking it down. If I did want to throw a ball in, I don't want it to break break down. I want right. it to hit the water, hit the bottom, and then break down. So basically what you've got there is absolute ultimate attraction. Yeah, everything that you want for a barbel mix. Right. I want the pellets uh, and the particles to sort of sit on the bottom, so we're creating a carpet of so, seed. So you're almost ringing a dinner bell for them to come and eat at the table, aren't you? Exactly. The third of a bag of pellets. There's no need to be shy. At the end of the day, barbel will eat a, a huge amount of food. They'll feed when they're ready and they'll stop when they're ready. I'll put less hemp than I put pellets in. The super seed is a, is a good large grain hemp seed. I'll just take handfuls. Just drain it off. You can see how much juice is on this hemp. Yeah. If you were to drain that off earlier, a good addition to ground bait is hemp, hemp liquor, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can add that to anything. So I'm just going to mix that in by hand now. We end up with a ground bait that's chock full of little particles, little attractants, bits fizzing off here and there. But the main thing is, is we're getting some bait to the bottom that will break down and create our bed of feed. You're going to have a better bait with one of those sat there on top with your hook in. Exactly that. I mean, barbel by their very nature, their browsers, you know, they'll sort of, you know, feast over and start picking up these particles. That's all on the bottom. Um, so generally, you know, they'll come around, much around, and then they'll come over top and boom, we're, we're ready in. to go. Yeah. First thing I've noticed before we start fishing uh, is your setup. It looks a little bit stronger than the type of thing I'd use on your average commercial. There's a lot that comes into play on the river, not only the heavy flow, but we've got rock slate beds, we've got rocks dotted around the river. There's so much that can cause your tackle to, to malfunction. So it's got to be robust and you've got to be using everything that you're confident in because a lost fish, especially with barbel, uh, means lost money really. Yeah. You can't afford to lose these fish. They do pull a little bit as well, don't they? Yeah, a nine pound barbel thrashing its head can do a lot of damage. I like to use a long feeder rod. This one's 13 and a half foot. I want as much line out of the water as possible. Right, I'm going okay. to be casting here today uh, two thirds across the river. Any debris coming down is going to catch the line. If the line's in the water, there's going to be a lot more drag, which is you know, potentially exactly. going to bump your feeder out, out of place. Exactly. If I use a really heavy line, then that's going to create drag as well. Yeah. So this has got to be balanced. So it's a case of making sure your lines are strong enough to do the job, but you don't want to be too strong that they're going to affect how much lead you need to use to hold the feeder steady. It can very quickly become unbalanced and you don't get the best from your rig. This is based around the old fashioned loop rig where the feeder would be running in a, a short loop, um, creating a sort of a running feeder, but then a bolt effect. What we've done is change the rig so that the rig is running on a double piece of line, but it's also with the, with the incorporation of the rig stops, okay? Those slide up away, and if it should become entangled, that will pull away, and the fish isn't gonna be dragging 
that feeder around. So you've, you've never got a tethered fish? Exactly. Right. When a barbel's shaking its head and that's rattling around, it's creating so much wear and tear on your line here. Yeah. And obviously the obvious answer is, well, you use a thicker line. But as I said, if you use a thicker line, you're not gonna, the rig's not gonna react so well. That's eight pound monofilament. When it's doubled up in a loop, you've basically got the equivalent to 16 pound line there. Right. In that part of the rig, which is the zone, which I would expect to take the most, the most hammer. By doubling this section of line up as well and putting knots in it, you're basically stiffening it, aren't you? Yeah. And that creates a sort of boom. Yeah, what it does is, it, it, as well as adding strength to the rig, it does create that stiff rig. So when the feeder is on the bottom, it keeps the hook bait away from the feeder, creating less tangles, but it can also ride up, the, the flow can catch in these knots, yeah. uh, and it creates a, sometimes a wafting hook bait, right, uh, okay. so up and down, so it's it's catching the flow as well. It's all adding to the effectiveness of the rig. The other key thing as well is I use these gripper stops, but I put two on the line together, with one facing what some people would term as the wrong way. Yeah. But the key with that is if you look on the, when the swivel, it's that, yeah. it kicks it out. That's interesting. Yeah. So you've almost got a 90 degree angle, which is keeping all your hook length and the line below the feeder away from the feeder. So when I cast out, I'm gonna get a lot less tangles. Moving down, I see you've got two and a half foot hook length. It's a diameter 021. Uh, so it's got a breaking strain of about eight, about eight pounds. It is a low diameter line, pre-stretched. Some people don't like using them. I, I, I find them fine. As long as you keep an eye on them during the session, I've got boxes full, tied up ready. So if I need to change, I can. it's, it's literally 30 seconds. I like the uh, the lie of that and the, the fish can't see it. I would have thought you'd have a hair rig on there, but you've got what looks to be a standard spade, very strong admittedly. How are you going to mount your pellets? I will start with a bunch of maggots. That might fly in the face of everything we've said about how but products being so the vogue bait for barbel. This is simply a matchman's approach to barbel fishing. There's an early opportunity to catch barbel in conjunction with grain bait because when that feeder is full of grain bait, you cast that out. Obviously, there's a lot of particles and bits and pieces that fly off that. There'll be a rush of fish that will come to that straight away. Right, okay. But when that hits the bottom, there's lots of bits coming off and they're not, they're not trickling along the bottom, they're actually going through they'll the bottom. They're going down on the flow, wouldn't yeah. they? Yeah. So yeah. the barb will instinctively come in and flash around and they can be quite territorial and they're quite aggressive feeders. Now if I put a pellet on, that's quite a heavy hook bait and that'll go straight on the bottom and lie on the bottom. Yeah. But at that stage, the barb will generally aren't ready to lie down and, and feed on the bottom. They're still flashing around and looking what's what's just landed in front of them. So I can catch with just a simple bunch of maggots, you can usually catch a couple of early fish all the time, there's plenty of particles in the grain bait going down and landing on the bottom, yeah. which they will settle on later. What I'm doing is just giving myself an opportunity to catch a couple of early fish, which as we know in match fishing is essential. And those early fish can be the difference between catching 30 pounds and catching 50 pounds at the end of the match. Giving me a great understanding of how, how the rig actually works with the ground bait in the flow and the fish coming in, that, that initial rush. Mm onto those flavours, they come straight in and you can pick them off on maggots. As the session progresses, I would expect them to get more uh, honed in on the bait that's landed on the bottom, right. um, in which case I might switch to, the, uh, to a block end feeder and just start feeding particles, pellets and hemp. Yeah. They'll be grazing over a bed exactly. then, won't they? So then they'll be picking up mm. baits off the bottom. I want to see it in action. So how long would you generally leave a cast in, Dave, before winding in and, and recasting? The way we always used to do it um, with feeder fishing on the river was you'd sort of cast out and you would leave it no time at all and wind it back in and cast and keep casting to try and build it up. With the size of feeders we're using and the amount of bait we're putting in, I'll literally, when your confidence is high, I'll leave that feeder in until I get a bite. It's such a big food parcel and it's got so many smells and attractants coming off it that really I can leave it there with the confidence that it's going to attract fish to it. Right, oh yeah, that is a fish. And this I think is a barbel. You can tell there. It looks it. <laughs> yeah, you can tell it's starting to move upstream. As soon as you hooked that, it stripped a bit of line off you, didn't it? It was a <laughs> these things growl a bit, don't they? They do. When they swim upstream, it does help a bit. The problem yeah. with the barbel is, is obviously that you don't have to look at the shape of them to realise uh, where they like to be that's on the bottom. There's something special about them. Every time you see them, they've just got such a presence about them. These are the key fish in some ways because these are the fish that you catch early. These are like the foot soldiers. They get in first. They want to see, they're the inquisitive ones. They want to Look see what's going that. on. Yes, we're in. You tend to catch these fish early on and then the bigger ones later on. And a fish of that, I mean, that's, that's a five pound fish. Look at that, perfect. Absolutely stunning. Look at the colors on it. You can see where they get their power from, though. Oh, look at that. Look what it's just... You see that? Look at that. It's actually just pooed halibut ground bait and halibut pellets all over your hand. I think that tells you how uh, 
how quick they're digesting this stuff. You know, they can't get enough of it if it's going through them that quickly. You see these pellets have hardly broken down. There's a whole grain of hemp there. It's not every day I like to be pooed on worth it. I think it's fair to say that halibut marine pellets have revolutionised barbel fishing as we know it. It's just the flavour that everything centres around for barbel fishing now. There's lots of little variants on it, but generally it catches all the fish. The barbel obviously know what they're eating, they feel is right for mm. them. It does seem to outscore most other baits. Now the pellets themselves are dark, solid consistency, they're high in oil so they've got a slower breakdown rate than a coarse, standard coarse pellet. When you're fishing in a river like this, and you've got, you've got the flow constantly running over, the slower breakdown is going to just be leaking those oils and those tractors over time into the swim, isn't it? Whatever is in the pellets, the, the fish obviously like it, but it obviously draws them into the area as well. There's a lot, lot of stuff coming up that, and they can find it from, from quite a far distance, so it might not, they might not come straight away. The longer those are in the water, the more fish are going to find them. They're made to a recipe that is of such a high standard. We developed the, the Halibut Marine Method Mix to be used in conjunction with Easy Pellets. The two marry up beautifully and that just gives you another way of feeding, another way of sort of impacting on the peg and, and, and you know putting something in the water that's going to make the barbel sort of suddenly wake up and think well what's that? Trigger them to feed really. It's good to have uh, variations you know you've got the different size pellets you've got 12 mils, 8 mils, 10 mils all that can be used on a hair rig or a band. Uh, we've got the mi mix tub here which has got them all in you know they're all different things so you've got something to try all the time because the reality the reality is in a five hour match you're not going to get bites all the time, you're not going to catch a barbel every cast so it's nice to have the variations and things to try, you say give that 10 minutes, give that 10 minutes yeah. and it gives you, keeps your mind active, keeps you trying and keeps different things and hopefully putting more fish in the net. These go right up to a massive 20 mil. Yeah, proper gobstoppers. Yeah. You catch barbel on those? Yeah. I mean, if you only have to look at the, look at a barbel's mouth to realise uh, they can take anything, and they'll take you know a lump of paste wrapped around that as well. So add to that, <laughs> I wouldn't be scared to use that in flood conditions at really? all. Really, that's unbelievable. So basically, halibut marine pellets. No matter what the condition of the river, there's something that's going to catch you barbel here all the time. Yes. Well, mate. Um, I'm a little bit gobsmacked by that, to be honest. I told you it was a good way of catching children barbel, didn't I? Uh, pellets on the float is the future. It's a, it's a method. It's another method, right? It's not just the method. It's, it's, it's well, on the right peg. It's a fantastic method, isn't oh, it? There's more than a few in there, Dave. Um, we've got, I think we're going to need a crane to get the net out. Don't we? Oh, yeah, you're right. Look at those chub. Fantastic bag of fish, isn't it? Unbelievable. Easily 80 pound plus there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And all on a bag, a couple of bags of carp pellets. Absolutely. I'm absolutely convinced. It just shows you what can be achieved on not too much bait, doesn't yeah. it? Awesome. Thank Cheers, you Bob. very much. Cheers.